We now come to the pinnacle of worship where we have an opportunity to humble ourselves before the preaching of God's Word. So will you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 7. We find ourselves this morning in verses 7 through 13. And I've entitled my discourse to you, The Relation of Law to Sin. Let me read this passage that we might get an overall grasp of what the Apostle is telling us here. Romans 7, beginning with verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, Did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. And through the commandment, that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. One of the most profound areas of self-deception in our lives is with respect to the severity and the scope of sin. We barely see the tip of the iceberg when we look at our lives. By nature, we have a very high view of ourselves. We can justify almost anything we do. We are very quick to blame somebody else for the things that we do that are dishonoring to God, and we are hopelessly biased in our own favor. If you don't think that is true, just examine your attitude the next time you are confronted by your husband or your wife or your parent over some issue that you know is wrong. We can see the speck in our brother's eye a mile away, but we have a very difficult time seeing the log in our own eye. Let me give you an example. Think of someone, perhaps, even in your church family, that you just don't like. You don't like being around them. You take every opportunity to denigrate them. You don't pray for them. You kind of have your list, you know. You've got that little book, so to speak, in your pocket where you keep a record of wrongs. They don't even know that you're scoring them. Well, Scripture says that we are commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves. God knows how much we love ourselves, and so that's a pretty tall order. Well, what does that look like in this case when you've got someone that you just don't like? You think that they're doing things that are absolutely wrong. Are you to keep a record of wrongs? Well, obviously not. Scripture forbids that. What you should do is gently confront your brother in their sin, if that's what it is. Scripture is very clear in Galatians 6.1, If any man is caught in a trespass, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. It goes on to say we are to bear one another's burdens, referring to our burden of their burden of sin, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. What is that? The law of love. You're to love them enough, if they're doing these things, to gently move into their life and try to restore them. In fact, Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Oh, my, now that's taking it to a whole new level. 
Well, do we do this? Typically not. Typically not. Why not? Because of pride. You see, it's much easier for us, it comes natural to us, to judge and condemn rather than love and restore. Just part of who we are. Again, think of how you react when somebody lovingly tries to restore you in some area of sin in your life. You see, it's because of sin that we have this, this lust, this craving within us to be superior to others. Pride comes naturally to us. And it's amazing how that we can justify these attitudes and these actions based upon this superior opinion that we have of ourselves. And we can very quickly point to our external religiosity to rationalize how superior we are and to justify why we refuse to love and why really that's okay. For that reason, Paul went on to say in Galatians 6 and verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. My friends, the text that we have before us in Romans 7 teaches us much about the issue of lust, about the issue of pride. We're going to see that they go hand in hand. Hand in hand. It's part of our sin nature. It's kind of at the very heart of our sin nature. And we're going to see this in relation to God's standard, in relation to the law. In fact, we read in 1 John 2, 16 about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. It all is connected together. And yet we are so blind to it. And unless God gives us spiritual sight, we simply cannot see ourselves as we really are. And what has he done to give us sight? He has given us his law, his standard of perfect righteousness to expose our sin and to drive us to humility and to the Savior. Of course, all of us, even as twice-born saints, those of us that truly know Christ and have been transformed, we still struggle with all of this. And we look at sin in our own life and we tend to just see the tip of the iceberg. We don't see all that is really there. All of the sin that remains in this physical body and of which we, 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 we are still incarcerated until we come to glory. But although sin no longer enslaves us, it is no longer our master, we still find ourselves yielding to it. It is an unwitting enemy that continues to entice us. It's a lusting malignancy that must be kept in check until it is removed forever in our glorified state. And this can only be accomplished through an act of God. Only when God does something to us when we are born again can we begin to get a handle on this. Only when he redeems us and regenerates us and reconciles us into himself and justifies us and indwells us that he might sanctify us. Now, this brings us back to the, to the Spirit's amazing revelation to us here in Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7. By way of review, you will recall that in chapter 6, Paul demonstrated that we cannot be justified by keeping the law. In other words, we cannot be declared righteous by God by doing something on our own. In fact, we have learned that to keep the law in an effort to become holy and therefore be reconciled to God really produces just the opposite. It actually becomes a hindrance to our salvation because he has made it clear that you simply cannot earn your way into heaven. You simply can't do that. You will never be good enough to live up to God's standard. Now, the Jews, as you will recall, would have obviously reacted to the climactic statement that Paul made at the end of chapter 6, there in, at the end of verse 20 and 21. He says, where sin increased, 
grace abounded all the more. That is, sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul anticipated the reaction from the legalistic Jews trying to earn their way to heaven. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And he says, may it never be. Then in the first six verses of chapter 6, he explains that we died to Christ, that when we died to Christ, we are dead to sin, we're freed from the tyranny of the master of sin. And then in the first six verses of chapter 7, he explains that when we died with Christ, we are now dead to the law, meaning we are freed from the penalty of the law that would condemn us. It is no longer our accuser. So even as a man can't be justified by keeping the law, chapter 6, he also cannot be sanctified by keeping the law in chapter 7. And of course, this was very confusing to the Jews. It might be to you as well, but it really can be simplified as we look at it closely. And so he is going to explain to them in chapter 7, as we looked at in the first six verses last week, that we have a new relationship to the law as believers, that we have a new relationship to Christ. We're a completely new person. We once were dead, and now we are alive. We have a new position. We were once under law, and now we're under grace. We have a new purpose. We used to bring forth fruit unto eternal death. Now we can bring forth fruit unto God. And we have a new power. We were once empowered by the flesh to satisfy the lusts of the heart. But now we can be empowered by the Spirit of God. And I must encourage you once again, as we look at this section of Scripture, realize that it has very, very practical implications for our lives right now as believers. And if we understand these glorious truths that the Spirit has revealed to us, it will literally transform our lives as we live them out. What we're going to learn this morning is simply this, that when we understand God's law, we will be driven to either hatred or humility. That's what the Word of God always does. Whenever it is preached, Whenever you share the gospel with somebody, it will do one of two things. It will either harden a heart or it will soften the heart. And I pray that it will soften your hearts here today. But if it drives you to humility and you bow down before God in desperation, you will cry out to Him for mercy because you know that you can never be reconciled to Him apart from that mercy, apart from that grace. And as believers, the more more we understand God's law, the more humble we become in and of ourselves. We see ourselves for who we are. We celebrate grace more. And that really frees us up and empowers us to truly love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. So let's examine the relationship of law to sin. Paul is going to explain four works of the law here. Number one, we're going to see that it exposes sin, as I've already alluded to. But secondly, we're going to see that it also incites rebellion. It incites rebellion. Thirdly, it insults pride. And finally, it illuminates the sinfulness of sin. Now, bear in mind that he has just explained in verse 5 here of chapter 7, that while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. And in verse 6, but now we have been released from the law. So again, naturally, his Jewish audience are going to think, okay, now wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that the law of God is sinful, that it is wicked, that somehow we ought to just throw it out and forget it altogether, live according to our own understanding, our own standards? Well, obviously not. And so he's going to continue by explaining what the law is and what it isn't and what it really does, the works of the law. So he begins to interact with the opposition here in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. 
we could translate it this way. You have got to be kidding me. Absolutely not. The law is not sin. He goes on to say, on the contrary, I would, have not, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So number one, we see that the law exposes our sin. Far from the law being sin, it is what exposes sin. Now think about it. None of us would have any idea what God's standard of righteousness is had he not communicated it to us through his word, through his law. So it's exceedingly beneficial. Now, to be sure, God has revealed a standard of right and wrong in the heart of every person that has ever lived, even those who do not know anything about the written, revealed law of God in Scripture, even those who do not know Christ. Romans chapter 2, verse 15 tells us that the law is written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So that's why we can see in every culture down through history, there is a basic sense of right and wrong that God has placed within everyone's heart. But the revealed law of God in Scripture far exceeds the moral code within the pagan. You see, that is a law that they can twist and distort and use to somehow accomplish their own agenda. But the law of God clearly delineates the divine standard. It's very black and white. And because of that, it renders every man guilty before a holy God. Have you ever said to yourself, I really want to know the will of God for my life? I hope you've said that. Well, my friends, you can find much of it written in the law, as we are going to see. And Paul is going to give but one example that is especially convicting in his life, and I believe it will be in all of our lives. Notice at the end of verse 7, he says, For I, should not, or for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Now, the word covet translates the Greek word epithemia, and it means to lust. It means to strongly desire what belongs to someone else or to crave that which is forbidden. To, to desire something that is evil. As I mentioned earlier in 1 John 2, 16, there we read about the lust of the flesh, the same word. The lust of the eye that produces the boastful pride of life. Romans 13, verse 14, Paul says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. It's the same word. So Paul is saying here that if it weren't for the law, he wouldn't have understood this whole idea of coveting. Now Paul is referring to the law that was given to Moses, the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and verse 17, we read about the Tenth Commandment of that Decalogue. There, God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, to make it real practical, that commandment alone just eliminated most all of American advertising. Because advertising is designed to make you dissatisfied, discontent with what you have, so that you will covet something else. They know how to tap into that sin that we all have. And have you noticed that many times they will use some very sexual image in order to grab your attention to appeal to the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh in order to get you to covet even more whatever it is they're trying to sell. Now, some of you might say, well, what's wrong with desiring a new car, for example? Does God forbid that? Well, of course not. That's not the issue. But what he for forbids is you being discontent with what you have 
and beginning to make an idol out of something that you don't have and beginning, therefore, to spend money that you don't have and go into debt that you don't need to go into in order to have that new car. That's the idea. This, this commandment also just eliminated virtually every television show. Because what does television typically sell? Sex, immorality, and on and on it goes. All of this is a violation of God's law. But now I want you to bear in mind, to covet is to have an inner craving for something that is forbidden. You see, sin is more than just external actions. It also includes internal desires. We're all guilty. We're all guilty here. Ask yourself, are you discontent with some area in your life? And I mean an area where you perhaps feel like you've been treated unfairly or, or you, you feel as though that, that God has given you a raw deal, a bad lot in life or whatever. I can assure you that if you look close enough, somewhere behind all of that, you will find the sin of covetousness fueling your discontentment in most cases. Are you jealous? Are you envious of others? Do you clamor after wealth? Are you a sucker for the get-rich-quick scheme? Are you lazy? Do you have a sense of entitlement? Do you expect others to take care of you? You know, our politicians really know how to tap into this sin of covetousness, don't they? They want you to buy into this class warfare issue to make you feel as though, man, I've been, I've been treated wrongly here. I deserve some. I'm going to vote for you so that I can get what I think I deserve. Do you enjoy thinking about or looking upon things that are forbidden, things that are immoral, pornography, for example? According to God's standard, even to desire these things is sin, even if you don't act on them. Think of the thousands of things that we crave in our heart, that we entertain in our mind, those things that run rampant in our imagination that God would forbid. This is the sin of covetousness. Now, when Paul, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who was keeping the law externally, understood that it's more than just externals, it's issues of the heart, he was devastated because he realized that there's no way he could meet that standard. Oh, yes, we may all look good on the outside, but God sees the heart, doesn't he? And it is within the heart that God demands purity. In Luke chapter 16, verse 14, Luke says that the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to Jesus and scoffing at him. Now, Paul may have been among that group. We don't know. And in verse 15, it says, And Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Wow, we're all guilty. I ask you, would you like for the last month of your life to be displayed on the screen up here for everybody to see? I'm not saying just your external behaviors. I'm, see, I'm talking about also the things that you thought, the things that you desired. I wouldn't. Aren't you glad we're hidden in Christ? Aren't you glad that God doesn't see that now? He sees the righteousness of Christ. Beloved, this is the issue of justification. It's Christ that makes us righteous, not we ourselves. And Paul is basically saying, I, I would have never known this apart from the law. Some of you may be like the ancient Pharisees who had convinced themselves and all the people that it is not a sin to just lust. It only becomes a sin when you act upon the lust. 
Oh, no. No, no, no. It's far more than that. For example, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. And there, by the way, he's, he's quoting the seventh commandment in Exodus 20, verse 14. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust, there's the term, epithemia, the same term. Everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Let me give you another example from Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 21. Back up a little bit in that text. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. That, by the way, is the sixth commandment. But he goes on to say in verse 22, but I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Raka is referring to a, an epithet that would, that would mean you fool or you, you idiot. I, any term of derision or contempt or hatred. And he goes on to say, and whoever shall say you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. In other words, when you have that kind of attitude of hatred towards another person, you violated the law. Also in 1 John 3, verse 15, we read, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, folks, we're all guilty there, aren't we? Let's be honest. Aren't there people in our lives that we hate? We hate to admit that, but if we're honest, we do. We have contempt for them. In God's eyes, that's as if we murdered them. Obviously, the consequences are different. But the heart attitude makes us guilty. He goes on to say in that text, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So if your heart is full of hate, you are basically capable of murder. That's the idea. Your attitude makes you guilty as the act. So again, you see, God... God's law judges a man's heart, not just his external actions. So who among us can stand up before such a standard, such a standard of perfection? No one except the man Christ Jesus. Now, remember, originally the law was written down and placed in a receptacle and put on the side of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And inside the ark were the tablets of stone, whereby God had carved the law and given to Moses on Sinai. You recall in Deuteronomy 31, verse 16, God says, Take this book of the law and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain there as a what? As a witness against you. You see, again, this is the purpose of the law to expose the hideous, devastating reality of our sin. And God has made it clear that any breach, any violation, is tantamount to breaking the whole law. So again, we're all guilty. And the consequence is eternal death. You say, my, that seems extreme. The reason we think that is because we have a very shallow understanding of the transcendent holiness of God. Now, why was it intended to be a witness against us? And the answer is simple. To drive us to God for mercy that is only available through faith in the one who perfectly fulfilled that law, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who paid the penalty for all who would trust in him as their Savior. So the law is not sinful nor is it responsible for sin, but in fact, it exposes the reality of sin in our heart. But secondly, it incites further rebellion. This is remarkable. Notice what he says in verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. My, this is a curious statement, is it not? 
Here, Paul carries his argument to another, another level. And the, the key to interpreting this text is to understand this little phrase, taking opportunity through the commandment, because he's saying that that's what sin did. Well, taking translates a Greek word that means to seize or, or to grasp a hold of something. And opportunity translates another word that means to, to give cause or give occasion for something. It was used, for example, to describe um, a staging area or base of operations from which a, an army could begin a military expedition. So we could translate this passage saying, sin seized the commandment as a base of operations and produced in me coveting of every kind. Here, sin is personified as, as an evil power that is antagonistic against the law, intent on making a mockery of it, using it as a base of operations to launch temptations and more sin that would violate that law. It's an amazing concept. So here's what Paul is saying, if I can paraphrase it this way. When I understood the law's prohibition against lust, my rebellious flesh was incited to either even further rebellion. It, it used the commandment as a staging area to launch an attack of every kind of coveting. He says, it produced in me. That translates a Greek term, katergodzomai. It means, uh, uh, it's a very powerful term. It speaks of, of that which, is, which accomplishes something with absolute success and thoroughness. It produced in me. Well, what did, it what did it produce? What did it accomplish? It incited further rebellion. And he expands upon the thought there at the end of verse 8. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, he's not saying that when there was no law that there was no sin, as some people might think, because there's always been law, even before the law in Sinai. We know that, that God's standard was in place. But what he's saying is, is when... When a man is ignorant of the depths of the law that even renders a verdict of guilty on our, on our desires, on our cravings, on our lusts, when a man is ignorant of that and therefore lives apart from that, sin tends to just kind of lie dormant. It doesn't react to all of that. We, we kind of see ourselves as pretty good. We don't even see our sin. So the law causes our sin nature to be provoked. It causes it, if you will, to come alive, to react, as it were. It's like malignant cells that many physicians tell us lie dormant in our bodies, as if they are somehow dead. But at times, various things can activate these cells and cause them to become alive and begin to corrupt our bodies. You see, it is characteristic of our sin nature to rebel against any kind of authority, especially God's authority. Man is by nature a rebel of his creator. He wants to be served, not to be served. Man wants a God that will bow down to him rather than one to whom he would bow down. And by nature, man resents rules and restrictions. Just look at our little children. Do you ever have to teach them to say no? Do they say yes more than they say no? No. It comes natural to them. It comes natural to all of us. And of course, this began in the garden. Remember with Eve. She basically said, I don't care what God said, I am going to have that forbidden fruit because of what I think it will accomplish for me. This is why men reject the gospel, isn't it? They refuse to submit to God. Instead, they insist that he submit to them. Life is all about me and what I want. It's not about God. 
It's not about serving him. Think how our culture despises God's authority. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's take the first commandment, which basically speaks that about the fact that we should only have one God, the one true God, no other gods before me, he says. And our culture says, no, 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 wait a minute. No, there's, there's not just, just one God here. There, there, there can be many gods or many, maybe it's one God but with many different names. And we're all free to choose our own God. For example, Allah is just another name for God, another name for Yahweh. Are you kidding me? Do you really believe that lie? My friends, Allah is a, sana- is a satanic counterfeit that damns men's souls. It is not Yahweh, but that's how we think, isn't it? We hear the law, we re- react against that. We don't like this idea of of just one God or just one way to heaven through Jesus Christ. There's many ways, we would say. How about the second commandment against idolatry, against worshiping and serving other gods of our own making or even worshiping the true God wrongly, desiring anything more than God, finding our ultimate satisfaction and, and joy in anything other than the one true God. Oh, we, we don't like that at all. We're not going to do that. We're going to do our own thing. And on and on it goes. Take God's prohibition against sex outside of marriage. <laughs> That's silly. It's all right to just shack up. How about his very clear prohibitions against homosexuality, transvestism, Transsexualism. No. That's, that's, that's way too harsh. In fact, now we're going to give them special treatment. Unbelievable. That's what political correctness is all about. It's to find wherever God says that we should do something and stretch that out and do something different. What happens when you insist that the moral authority that we should have in our lives is the written, revealed Word of God. What's the type of reaction you get? People absolutely become apoplectic in rage. They they think you are a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal if you honestly believe that idiocy. They mock, they scoff, they, they resort to violence. The point is they hear the law and they sin even more. It incites people to further rebellion. Let me press this point a bit further. You know, again, it is one thing for sinful man to be offended by God's law when it condemns certain external behaviors. But, oh, my goodness, it is even more insulting to think that his law would render us guilty because of our desires. I mean, that is just absolutely over the top. I can hear it now. Are you telling me that to just lust after a woman makes me as guilty as if I have committed adultery with her? My response is, no, I'm not saying that. Jesus, who is God, said that. Well, fine. If that's the way it's going to be, I'm going to reject that stupid law, and and, and I'm going to let my lust take me wherever I want them to go. That's the automatic attitude. You see, sinful man is hopelessly independent. By our nature, we are self-centered. We are self-absorbed. We are self-determined. We are self-willed. We see that this at work even among the saints. Think of people's typical reaction to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Oh, my goodness, you want to start a fight, that will start one almost every time. People absolutely hate that. What about the free will of man? And they get all upset about it. You see, such antagonism is innate within us. You need to expect it. Because any doctrine that challenges man's rabid commitment to self-determination will be met with antagonism. 
We demand to be autonomous, to be independent. Why? Paul tells us because sin seizes the law as a base of operations and produces within us coveting of every kind. You see, we crave a God that will bow down to us. We crave being the master of our own destiny. We crave being able to do our own thing without consequence. You see, friends, if you raise up any one of God's standards, you will find that it will become a bullseye, an absolute target for the arrows of rebellion. That is just instinctive. That is our inner response to rebel against God. That is Paul's point. Remember in chapter 5, verse 20, he says, And the law came in that the transgression might what? Might increase. There you see it as well. Now, I think we tend to underestimate the power of sin. And I find this to be staggering as I meditated upon it. I mean, friends, think about this. Our sin is so powerful that it can actually use the holy law of God to make us sin even more. It's an amazing thought to me that it can use God's law as a base of operations to launch more sin. It uses God's standard of righteousness to incite even more rebellion within our hearts. No wonder Satan and his minions spend so much time and so much energy in the church using the very Word of God to incite people to rebel against the Most High. But now let's be careful. Let's don't blame it all on Satan here. Think of the power of our flesh. That's what Paul is seeing. He sees the law in his flesh in light of that. and There's no way, he's saying, that I can live up to that. That's why he said in Romans 8, verse 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Dear friends, once again, I have to say to you, our only hope of being reconciled to a holy God is by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. No man can be justified by keeping the law, nor can he be sanctified by keeping the law. We've got to come to Christ knowing this, that we're utterly bankrupt. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are spiritually destitute, who realize that they are helpless to be able to somehow conform to God's righteous standard. They're hopeless in all of that. And he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, referring to mourning over the reality of our sin. So the law exposes our sin. Secondly, it incites further rebellion. But Paul says, thirdly, that it insults our pride, our self-righteous pride. Notice in verse 9, And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive. Literally, it sprang to life. Sin became alive, and I died. May I explain it this way? Paul is saying something like this. I thought I was quite spiritual before I understood the law. I thought I was quite alive. I was doing well in my ignorance. How often we say ignorance is bliss. But when the commandment came, when I understood the truth of God's law, that he demands purity in the heart, sin became alive and I died. What a striking reversal. First he says, sin is dead, and I am alive. And then he says, sin is alive, and I am dead. So what's he saying here? He's saying this. When I was living apart from the law, sin was dead, and I was alive. Sin really wasn't provoked that much. I wasn't really reacting to it. I thought I was living the law. And so I thought I was alive. But then... The law showed me something different. 
You see, before, sin had not yet been provoked by a true grasp of the law. So I felt very good about myself. I was a Pharisee. I kept the law. I fulfilled all of those externals, even though my heart was rotten. Then I began to see that I was a self-righteous hypocrite. I believed that I could justify and sanctify myself. But when I understood the law, when I really grasped the reality of what God required, suddenly sin became alive and I died. I, I was ruined. Sin went on a rampage. It not only animated my resentment and incited me to further rebellion, but I began to see sin everywhere in my inner man. Suddenly I began to see that I was more guilty than I could have ever imagined. Sin was alive in me. I, I saw corruption lurking in every cavern of my imagination. It was in every little room within my heart. And I realized that I was hopelessly guilty before God. Moreover, I was utterly helpless to do anything about it because this is my nature. Oh, God, what am I going to do? I was once like the Pharisees in Jesus' parable in Luke 18. Remember that Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray? In verse 11 of that text, it says that the Pharisee said this, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. You see, Paul would have reacted that, to that and said, you know, but, but it was the tax gatherer that truly understood the law, that truly understood the depths of his sin, that sin was dead to me, but it was, it was alive to him. You see, I was alive in my self-righteous pride. I was alive in all of my ignorance. But the tax gatherer, he, he was dead. The law had brought him low. He recognized the depths of his sin, and he was in utter ruin. And I was alive in my self-righteous pride and, and my hypocrisy. Luke goes on to record Jesus' description of that broken-hearted tax gatherer in verse 13. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, wasn't even will was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Oh, would to God that every man fall dead before the law, for then and then only can he be saved. Would to God that every man beat his breast and cry out for mercy, pleading for grace, while all the time being convinced that, that he not only does not deserve it, but he could probably never have it. Because never is a man closer to mercy and grace than when he is quite assured in his heart that he can never have it, that he does not deserve it. Oh, dear friends, see the law of God for what it is, and you will see yourself for who you really are. Then and then only will you be able to see the Savior for who He is. Then and then only will you be able to truly be amazed at His grace. Paul described his life in Philippians 3, verse 6. At the end, he said, As to the righteousness which is in the law... He said, I was found blameless. He was referring to the external righteousness. You know, I was keeping the law. I was found blameless. But he goes on to say, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. 
More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, now catch this, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Therein is the heart of the gospel, my friends. Later in Romans chapter 10, Verses 3 and 4, Paul described the, the spiritual condition of the Pharisees, and this would have been a description of his life as well prior to coming to Christ, and perhaps this describes you. There he says, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. And oh, what a blessed thought to know that it is by God's grace that we can ever even see these things. It is by God's grace that we are broken over our sin and we cry out to Him in that brokenness and contrition, oh, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. It is God who causes us to even understand these things. Remember in Romans 6, at the end of verse 17, He said, that God caused you to become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. It is God who made us to be committed to the glorious truths of the gospel. And again, the more we understand the law of God, the more we will see ourselves for who we really are. This will produce within us genuine humility. And as a result of that, we will celebrate God's grace more and more in our lives, and we will have compassion on those who are in sin, those who are lost and dying, and even our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we will therefore be freed up to lovingly move into their lives because of our concern for them so that they can see their sin and repent. And we will be willing to get underneath that burden of sin and help carry that burden with them. Beloved, this is such incredibly good news, isn't it? To think that as believers we have been delivered from the power of sin and the penalty of the law. Just an astounding thought. The law of which, according to Romans 8, 4, is the requirement of the law, it says, is fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. You see, again, the flesh, <laughs> it, it is powerless here. It, it, is, it is weak. It is filled with sin. We don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Though the body is dead because of sin, yet our spirit is alive because of His righteousness. So indeed, the law insults our self-righteous pride. Verse 9, he says, And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. You see, again, the law cannot bring blessing to those who do not believe because they can't obey it. Verse 11, for sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. In other words, sin tricked me into believing that I was somehow good enough on my own to make myself acceptable to God, and therefore I had no need for a Savior. I could obey the law on my own. Here in verse 11, Paul reiterates the, the action of sin described in verse 8. But here, I want you to notice as we wrap this up this morning, Paul is referring to, I believe, Eve's temptation in the garden here. And we see that through the use of the verb deceived. Through the com sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me. You see, think about it. Prior to that first sin... Man was very much alive and at peace with God, but what happened? What did Satan use? He used the commandment as a beachhead to launch his assault of sin. What was the commandment? Thou shalt not eat of it lest you die. He deceived her. He ignited the fire of human lust. Sin was introduced through a delusion, through a deception. 
The thing that Eve desired, the thing that she coveted, was forbidden. God had forbidden that. Ah, oh, but that's what I'm going to want. And it was not what the tempter promised it would do. And that's the way sin always is, isn't it? Temptation always promises some blessing, some great benefit in life, but it always delivers the opposite. And, of course, the greatest and most popular deception of our day is that somehow man is good enough on his own to merit God's love, that he, on his own, can live up to that divine standard. For this reason, Paul goes on to say, so then, the law is holy. In other words, it's not the law that was sinful. It, it, it was my flesh. It, it, it did not inspire sin. The, the law is holy here. But the commandment became the occasion of sin, the opportunity for sin to be ignited within me, and death became the tragic result. So verse 12, he says, the law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. And then he finally closes this section, number four. He illuminates the sinfulness of sin, speaking of the law, that it illuminates the sinfulness of sin. Verse 13, he says, therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin. Yes, the law caused me to die to my self-righteous pride, but it was not the cause of the condemnation of eternal death to me. That was all the result of sin. The point is, don't blame the law. Blame the law breaker. It was sin, he says, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. My friends, I would challenge you with this thought. How do you view sin? Ask yourself, how do you view sin in your life? Do you view it as merely making mistakes? Oh, but my good far outweighs my bad. Is that how you think? Or is it utterly sinful? as we read here in verse 13. Is your sin really nothing more than a lawless rebellion against the Most High God? Call it for what it is. Is that how you see it? I hope so. Is it exceedingly more vile and reprehensible than you can ever imagine? Or is sin to you just merely doing something stupid from time to time? But it's really not that big of a deal because, again, your good outweighs your bad. Or is it an innate inability to conform to the moral character and desires of a holy God? Is it a wickedness that flows from the well of a heart that is deceived and desperately wicked, that is filled with self-will and self-determination, poisoned by desires for those things that God forbids? Well, if your answer is the former, you are deceived and you will remain under divine condemnation for eternity unless you repent and believe the truth to see yourself as God sees you. And if that's the case, you will confess the latter. And I would plead with you this morning to embrace the same truths that that ancient rabbi embraced, the Apostle Paul, that you too might be saved. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to pastor, Bible teacher, and author David Harrell. For more information or to order additional tapes or CDs of Pastor Harrell's messages, please visit olivetreeresources.org.